I had been thinking about making a video about a measurement technique called dynamic light scattering when I came across the videos by Numberphile and 3BlueOneBrown on Bertrand's Paradox, links in the description. While I can't say that there are mathematical parallels between the two topics, I did want to draw some very loose philosophical parallels. Bertrand's Paradox poses a deceptively simple question about the probable length of a random chord drawn in a circle, and reveals that the answer varies depending on what you define as a uniform distribution of random chords. Dynamic light scattering, or DLS, is often used to answer another supposedly simple question. What is the average size of the microparticles in my sample? But it turns out that there is more than one useful way to calculate such an average. So let's talk a little bit about DLS. DLS is used to measure the average size of microscopic insoluble particles roughly in the range of 1 nanometer to 10 microns suspended in a liquid. These mixtures are often called emulsions or colloidal suspensions. And particle size is an important engineering parameter because it influences properties like viscosity, stability, and diffusion. A common example is milk, which is a suspension of microscopic fat globules in an aqueous solution. Paint is a suspension of pigment particles and binder in a solvent. Many pharmaceuticals are formulated as emulsions for a variety of reasons, often because they're insoluble in water or blood, and emulsification improves stability and targeted delivery. I'll cover some of the physical details of how DLS works in the second half of the video. While DLS is not the only particle sizing technique out there, it is among the most popular, for the simple fact that modern instruments make it incredibly easy to perform. Just fill the cuvette with a bit of your sample colloidal suspension, stick it in the machine, click a button, and in less than a minute, there you have it, four different numbers for average particle size. Wait, what? The problem here is that there's more than one way, more than four ways even, to calculate the average. Any of these averages can be deemed more or less valid depending on the situation, and asking what is the correct average diameter is misguided. The questions that you need to answer first are 1. What are you using the data for? And 2. How does the instrument actually work to measure or calculate an average, whether it's DLS or a different particle sizing technique? So let's start with the first question and discuss why you need to calculate the average diameter differently depending on your specific application. The number that you probably imagine when I say average diameter is called the number average diameter or number weighted mean diameter or arithmetic mean dn. Imagine being given a photo of a bunch of spheres of different sizes and being asked to calculate their average diameter. Most likely you would just measure the diameter of each sphere, tally up all the numbers, and take the average. That would be the number weighted average. It's simple and can be useful in biological research where number counts of things like cells, bacteria, or viral particles are needed. But in other fields, it's often the least useful average to report. Why? Here's another example. In this photograph, what is the average size of the stuff in my hand? You might estimate 2 centimeters or so. Sorry, that is incorrect. The average is closer to maybe a tenth of a millimeter or 100 microns. What you missed is that I had been baking and there are thousands and thousands of microscopic grains of flour coating my hand, which brings down the average. Now don't you feel silly? Well you shouldn't, because this is absurd. The fact is that most of the mass and most of the volume of a collection of particles comes from the larger particles, and these larger particles can have a greater impact on important properties such as viscosity of the mixture. This brings us to the second way to calculate average diameter, volume weighted mean diameter dv. This metric is often used in mining and milling applications where it's also called the de Broeker mean. In this calculation, each particle is weighted by a factor of the diameter cubed, so a particle that is 100 nanometers in diameter counts a thousand times more than a smaller 10 nanometer particle in calculating the average. Formally, the equation looks like this, where nj is the number of particles with diameter dj. Note that the volume average is always larger than the number average because dv is biased towards larger particles. The difference between the two numbers can be indicative of how broad the particle size distribution is. If all of the particles are exactly the same size, the sample is called monodispersed, and the number and volume averages are equal. If the particle size distribution is spread out, the sample is called polydispersed. Polydispersity is often quantified in the polydispersity index, or PDI. A perfectly monodispersed collection of particles has a PDI of zero. Now you might say, but dv is a weighted average, and isn't that bad? Like putting your finger on the scale? Well first, let me remind you, absurd. Secondly, it could be said that the number average is also weighted, just with a unique biasing factor. This equation for calculating averages can be generalized for any power of weighting factor. The volume average is also sometimes labeled as d43. The number average is d10. Another important average is the surface area weighted mean, or Sauter mean, d32, where the average is weighted by a factor of diameter squared. This is useful for applications where the surface area is important, like catalysis or fuel combustion. Again, the more important question is what biasing factor you choose and why. So there you go, dn, dv, and pdi. Those numbers should tell you all you need to know about the sizes of your part of uh, Dang it. Alright, let's cover these other two. In fact, dz is the default number reported by DLS measurements, not dn or dv. The reason why has to do with the second important question I mentioned earlier. How does the instrument actually work? How does DLS measure average diameter? 
Colloidal suspensions are often cloudy or turbid because light bounces or scatters in every direction off of the particles in suspension. In a DLS instrument, a laser beam is fired at a sample colloidal solution and the scattered light intensity is detected at certain angles. The intensity of scattered light increases with particle size according to theories developed by Lord Rayleigh and Gustav Mie. For the sake of simplicity, we'll just consider the Rayleigh limit, where the particles are much smaller than the wavelength of light. In that case, the intensity of light scattered by a particle scales with the diameter to the sixth power. Thus, the intensity average diameter, di, is something close to d76. So in this case, a 100 nanometer particle counts a million times more than a 10 nanometer particle. This value may be useful for optical properties like turbidity and transparency. It's also a big reason why samples for DLS measurements need to be free of dust. Scattered light from large particle contaminants easily overwhelm the real scattering signal. We're almost done, but there's one major complication. Scattered light intensity increases with particle size, but it also increases with particle concentration. In order to distinguish between these two factors, DLS actually measures how the scattered light intensity fluctuates over time, hence the dynamic part of dynamic light scattering. The light scattered by individual particles will interfere constructively or destructively with each other depending on their positions relative to the detector, and microscopic particles are always moving in a liquid due to Brownian motion. As a result, the light scattered by these particles will appear to flicker, as particles to go around in the spot of the laser beam. Due to hydrodynamic drag, large particles move slower than small ones as modeled by the Stokes-Einstein equation. So, small particles show a low intensity of scattered light with a high frequency of flickering, while large particles show a low frequency of flickering but scatter more light per particle. This flickering is related to the diffusion coefficient of the particle, and this diffusion coefficient is then used to calculate an average diameter. This involves quite a bit of math that may be worth covering another time, all of which is automatically handled by the DLS software. This finally brings us to dz, which is the intensity weighted harmonic average, or z average diameter for short. The weighting factor in this case is not straightforward, and the reason for this formulation goes back to how DLS calculates diameter from the Stokes-Einstein equation. For the case of small particles and the Gaussian distribution particle sizes, dz simplifies to an average diameter weighted by a factor of d to the fifth power, so its absolute value often falls between dv and di. dz is the default value reported by the DLS software because it is the one that is most directly measured by the raw scattering data, with the fewest assumptions, and is therefore the most reliable. Because light scattering intensity is so ludicrously dependent on diameter, the number distribution of smaller particles in the sample can be hard to precisely measure. This is where the practical issue of the specific measurement technique and how it works factors into the discussion. Another way to think about it is that DLS directly measures dz, and it calculates other averages based on that number plus some approximations. dv and dn calculated from DLS data should be considered as useful estimates for comparison but potentially unreliable. If volume or number averages are of critical importance to your application, then consider using a different particle sizing technique that more directly measures them like laser diffraction or nanoparticle tracking analysis. Now I'm speaking loosely and skipping a lot of nitty gritty practical details of DLS measurements. If you want a quick addendum video covering some of those details, then maybe let me know in the comments and I might even get Footnote Goblin to help if I can get him to sit still for more than 5 seconds. So there you go, a quick introduction to how DLS measures particle size, and how a simple value, like average diameter, is really not so simple. Going back to Bertrand's paradox, I couldn't help but think about how the different ways of drawing chords are like weighted distributions, similar to weighted averages of particle sizes. The questions I wanted to ask are, what would you consider to be the weighting factors that govern the distribution of chords in each of the three examples, and might there be situations in which any one of these options is correct? I generally fall into the camp that says that it is misguided to demand a single quote-unquote correct answer without first addressing more fundamental establishing questions. After all, knowing the answer doesn't matter if you are asking the wrong question.